Howdy, y'all. The Tartarian Peace, often referred to as the Pax Mongolica or the Pax Tartarica, may be the most important, loosely defined event of our ancestral past. Throughout the abundance of videos, looking through history, my own videos included, as we focus on the old world, we often find residue of a unified ancient world culture, which seem to leave its traces throughout the origins of many major cities worldwide. Some are quick to deny this, others quick to make claims of the true origins of our current rendition of society. On my channel, we look to focus on the traditional or current narrative, often comparing and contrasting events in this narrative which seem to discredit one another, or entire narratives which seem to smooth over what should be seemingly glaring details. Recently, I came into contact with someone who was quick to question my belief about certain events in history. One question that they repeatedly asked me was, if Tartaria or Tartary was real, when did it exist? I believe as we look into the Pax Tartarica or the Tartarian piece, we can surmise an answer to this question. At the same time, modern historians are quick to label the fall of Constantinople in the year 1453 as the event which seemingly single-handedly marked the end of the last remains of the Roman Empire and the end of the medieval period in general. What if I told you, in my opinion, it was the Pax Tartarica which not only ended what we refer to as medieval times, but also brought the whole of Europe into a period of enlightenment, leading directly to the so-called Renaissance of the 1400s. This Pax Tartarica period seemingly amalgamated the former Roman Empire with its holy Roman Christian cause, and they were accepted into the Golden Horde, leading to events of biblical proportions. These events infiltrated the very way of life of every major country across most of Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and even into Northern Africa. The extent of this expansion and the root cause for what occurred will be the basis for these videos. Today will be part one. The Pax Tartarica is modeled after the Pax Romana, a roughly 200 year period from 27 BC through 180 AD when Rome had its greatest territorial extent and its population exceeded 70 million people. However, the Pax Tartarica is more closely related to the Pax Caesarica, a roughly 250 year time period when the Khazars dominated the Pontic Steppe and the Caucasus Mounds. This occurred roughly during the year 700 AD through 950 AD. The Pax Caesarica was facilitated by the Khazars controlling the trade route along the Silk Road between China, the Middle East, and Kaivan Rus, while simultaneously this Khazarian state served as a buffer state for the Byzantine Empire between them and the Hunnic tribes to the east. The Khazars are said to have undetermined origins. The Khazars stem from southern Siberia and are assumed to be an offshoot of the Huns or of Hunnic origin. However, we're told the names Turk and Khazar were used interchangeably since as early as BC Roman times making determining their true history and their true origin nearly impossible. We're told the Khazars were most likely leaders of a complex Iranian tribe, comprised also of Proto-Mongolian, Uralic, and Paleo-Siberian Scythians, who vanquished the Asian Avars in roughly 552 AD and then spread this tribe westward. We're told this embryonic Khazarian state was known as the first Turkish Empire, also known as the Land of the Blue Turks or the Land of the Celestial Turks. This amalgamation of tribes then sought Byzantine assistance in 568 AD in looking to conquer Persia. By the early 600s, a war of succession broke out between the various tribes in this Khazarian Empire. This led to the creation of a multitude of smaller kingdoms being formed, including Old Great Bulgaria. The Bulgars and the Khazars continued to jockey for dominance of the Pontic Steppes until the Bulgars finally fell to Khazarian rule in 679. This is when the remaining Bulgars who did not assimilate 
fled to form the first Bulgarian Empire in the Balkans. Thus, Khazaria was formed as the most direct descendant of the Celestial or Blue Turks. Khazaria was known as the Steppe Atlantis. Elaborating on this further, the Iranian King of Kings, Khuzro I, had three thrones placed directly next to his. One was for the King of China. One was for the King of Byzantium. And finally, most importantly, a throne for the King of the Khazars. Multiple sources allude to the fact that up until roughly 950 AD, Khazaria was considered one of, if not the most important kingdom in the world. Khazaria had a dual kingship government, a structure typical of nomadic Turkish tribes, emerging from or intertwined directly with Judaism. The lesser king was known as Shad or Isa, while the greater king was known as Hakan or Kayan. Kayan or king of kings can also be pronounced in its much more common form, Khan. However, Kayan literally means Khan of all Khans. The Shad managed the military and nation's conquests, while the Hakan was more of a living deity. The Hakan or Hakan would be chosen from Khazar House of Notables, and in strange ritual would select the number of years that he would like to rule. At the end of this number of years, the Hakan is then put to death by the Khazarian nobles, where his tomb is then buried in great fashion and river water is diverted to flow over the burial site, hiding the tomb and reshaping the landscape around it. The Pax Khazarica or Khazar Peace is said to have begun in roughly 700 when the majority of the Khazars converted to Judaism. The ruling class of the Khazars, like that of the Golden Horde, was said to be made up of primarily similarly featured individuals being a relatively small group that differed ethnically and linguistically from the majority of its subject peoples. Meaning, the Khazar kings spoke a different language and had much different features than the many people who they ruled over. We're told the Khazar kings were protected by the Khazar guards, or the Arsaya, a group of Muslim warriors thought to be the Alans. The Khazar army was considered to be roughly 10,000 strong, with the ability to be tripled on a moment's notice, as each noble Khazar family also had a form of army reserve in their respected kingdoms. The division of the Khazar army would be led by a singular Kayan Bek, commanded by officers known as Tarkins. If the Tarkan or Tarkin was defeated, the entire army would refuse to return back to Khazaria, as to lose a battle was to be condemned to death. Khazaria, during the Pax Khazarica, was compromised of 25 to 28 or more distinct ethnic groups besides the ruling class, which made up the smallest ethnic group amongst the Khazars. While being the smallest group, the ruling class consisted of nine distinct groups within that, or clans, with each one being allocated one of the nine kingdoms of Khazaria. The ruling class was known as the Whites, or the White Khazars, and are described in multiple sources as being strikingly beautiful, unique, with pale skin, reddish golden hair, and blue eyes. The elite warriors, or the protectors, the guards of the ruling class, Another of the 25 or 28 groups that made up Khazaria were said to be known as the Black Khazars. They were said to be bronze-skinned, short, robust, and muscular, with dark hair and usually dark but sometimes hazel or even blue eyes. During the Khazarian peace, many nearby kingdoms or kingdoms in direct trade with Khazaria sometimes would adopt similar societal models for their upstart kingdoms. The most infamous of these would have to be Ruz, or Kaivan Ruz, or the Ruz Kayanate, modeled directly after Khazaria. Ruz was directly to the east, and amongst forming, Ruz leadership adopted the title of Kayan as early as 800 AD. The title Kayan would be used to describe the first princes of Kievan Ruz, where its capital Kiev 
was said to be a Khazar city. Furthermore, one of the largest and most intricate lost fortresses in all of history would have to be the Sarkel Fortress, aka the House of the White or the White House, said to be built by the Byzantine under orders of the Khazars to defend Khazarian interests from Kaivan Ru's invasion. This lost fortress was said to be built entirely out of red brick and giant white limestone. Khazar's fall began with the Alans, mentioned earlier as possibly being a tribe which some historians consider to be the warrior guards of the Khazarian leadership. The Alans, under influence from the outside Byzantine Empire, are pushed to convert to Christianity by the late 800s at which time the Alans enter into an alliance with the Byzantine Empire, who encourages them to destroy Khazaria from within. This occurs under orders from Leo VI the Wise, and Khazaria was using Kiev at the time primarily to control all of the Eastern Slavic tribes. However, when Oleg of Novgorod gained control of Kiev in roughly 880, he laid the foundation for the Rus Empire to flourish. For centuries, the tribes of Rus had been allowed to use the Khazar trade routes. However, with the loss of Kiev, Khazaria cut off trade with the Slavic tribes. This led directly to the tribes of Rus repeatedly raiding Khazarian cities, leading only to more discourse. By 940, Byzantine and Khazar relations had nearly deteriorated entirely with Khazaria refusing to allow trade through their controlled routes. At the same time, the land surrounding Khazaria began to convert to Islam, leading new trade routes to be formed between these Muslim territories. Cutting Khazaria out of the equation entirely, causing Khazaria's economy to collapse. Khazaria finally fell completely in roughly the year 970 to the Kiev prince Svatoslav and his armies. The fortress of Sarko and the Khazar capital of Attil were sacked and completely left in ruins. According to the Russian chronicle, the primary chronicle, says in the year 986, all traces of Khazaria were removed from the record. This is the time when Vladimir met with the religious leaders of Kievan Rus to decide the religion for that land going forward. A visitor to Attil, Khazar's former capital states that by the year 1048, the city was still entirely in ruins. Attil had been famous for having the largest vineyard in the Khazarian landscape, as well as one of the largest gardens in the world. In 1048, it was written that not even a single tree remained in the city and not a hospital or almshouse existed for the thousands of homeless. Then, from roughly the 11th century onward, the land of Khazaria gains this infamous reputation. It's not exactly allowed to be written about in the Russian Chronicle, at least in the context of the true history of the landscape. So the stories that do survive, and much of what we read today, comes from verbal tradition as opposed to written record. We have multiple myths and legends that arise about the devastated lands of Khazaria. What was once the richest and most powerful trade kingdom in the known world had subsequently been erased from many aspects of the timeline. The Great Seljuk Empire, for example, has legends that tie its foundation directly to the Khazars. The Khazar state is often said to be the only true Jewish state to have existed from the fall of the Second Temple until the establishment of Israel, and the word Khazar became a synonym with the Jewish faith, at least in Turkish and Muslim narratives until at least the 13th century. That is, when all the myths and legends seem to culminate, when another, even more vast, even more unexplainable conquering would occur. That is, the rise of the Golden Horde and the timeline of the Great Tartarian Peace. The leader who is most associated with the rise of the Great Tartarian Peace of the Golden Horde is one Genghis Khan, Khan being a form of the earlier Khazar, Khayyan. However, as we dive into the true nature of the Golden Horde 
of their endeavors, their tales, their triumphs, the ways that they shaped the mankind which we live in today as we focus on their resilient leader. One thing that is not often mentioned in the current narrative is that the Pax Tartarica, or this Tartarian peace, was not only modeled after the Pax Caserica, but the ancestry of Genghis Khan's educators, his teachers, those who taught him the ways that he would conquer, can be traced back directly to Kazaria, with even more outlandish theories claiming that the Golden Horde leader himself may actually come from the Kazarian royal bloodline. So won't you please join me for part two as we dive further into the Pax Tartarica?